which part of your body would you most like to change? And how did that question make you feel? For many people, the answer to the first question pops instantly into their head. And for many people, the way that makes them feel is shame. So I want to talk to you today about shametenance, which is my word for shame maintenance, the maintenance of shame. I'm going to tell you what shametenance is, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with it, and I'll offer some suggestions for what we can do collectively to fight it. But first of all, let's back up a bit. How do I know that many of you would have had an answer to that question and that you'd have felt shame about it? Well, one way I know is that people tell me. So I wrote a book called Intact, A Defense of the Unmodified Body, and when it was published, I went around the country doing lots of talks and interviews. And every time I did this, the person who was interviewing me would raise with me their worries about some part of their body. Often this would be backstage, before the talk began, or at the end of the interview, after the recording had ended. One time I did a talk at the Hay Festival and there was a book signing afterwards, and at the next table was Jarvis Cocker, the lead singer of the 90s band Pulp. Now, unsurprisingly, the queue of people waiting to meet him was much, much longer than the queue of people waiting to meet me. But as the staff member looking after me said, his queue is much longer, but your queue is much slower. Everyone wants to talk to you. Um, and it's true, people would do this. They would talk to me about their struggles, perhaps with age or with weight. Uh, people would talk to me about their struggles with visible difference. One man told me that he would never take his top off at the beach. Lots of young people told me about their struggles with social media and dealing with those expectations online. But another way I know about people's feelings about their bodies is through large studies. So one large study of tens of thousands of adults found that 70% of women felt media pressure to have a perfect body. Not just a good body, but a perfect body. And that same study found that two thirds of men were ashamed of their body. We can also look at surveys of young people. So Girl Guiding does a survey of girls' attitudes every year. The most recent survey found that girls are less happy about their appearance than they were in 2009, and that they feel ashamed of their bodies and ashamed of their appearance as a result of the unrealistic expectations placed on them online. So all of this adds up to what psychologists call an epidemic of appearance anxiety. So why is this? Why do so many of us feel ashamed about our bodies? Is it because our bodies have got worse? Are our bodies objectively bad? Uh, no. The way I see it is this. If all of us feel bad about our bodies, then our bodies can't be the problem. The problem has to be the overwhelming influence that we live in our society that tells us that our bodies are wrong. Cosmetic companies tell us that if we buy their products, our skin or our hair will be better. Influencers tell us that if we follow their exercise and diet regime, our body shape will conform to the ideal. Cosmetic surgeons invent new procedures and new invasive um, practices that we can undergo. Social media encourages us to compare our appearance with images that have all been filtered or modified in some way. And all of these influences are trying to sell us something. So the latest trend is high-end anti-aging skincare regimes for preteen girls. This is a trend that is started by influencers, paid influencers on TikTok and Instagram, and then spread out through peer pressure and peer trends. Now, 10-year-old girls don't want anti-aging creams because their skin needs it. In fact, dermatologists say that often these kinds of products can be damaging on such young skin. So 10-year-old girls want these things because of the influence they are under. They are the victims of an aggressive economic campaign based on appearance anxiety. 
The best thing from a commercial point of view is if a company can get us to be worried about body parts that we were never worried about before. So if you think about this in the last few years, we've seen the emergence of practices like buttock enlargements, faux freckles, and more recently, eyelash serums. Who knew that you had to worry about whether your eyelashes were moisturized? Well, you do, apparently, but don't worry, there's a product that will sort that for you. So this brings me back to shame tenants. Shame tenants is all the things that we do, individually and collectively, to keep our bodies shameful. We maintain shame sometimes by actively shaming others or ourselves, but we also maintain shame by keeping our bodies or the practices or the things that we do private, invisible, unsayable. And we foster shame tenants when we submit to the ideas that our bodies are just not good enough. Now, shame about our bodies is so deeply part of our culture that we expect it. So at the start of the talk, I said that most of you would have an easy answer to the question, which part of your body would you like to change? But perhaps I was wrong. Right? Perhaps if I picked on someone in the audience, that person might say, I don't want to change anything about my body. I'm perfect just as I am. Now, my suspicion is if that person did answer in that way, the rest of us might be unimpressed. We might find that to be a very arrogant answer. We might think, you know, who do they think they are? They're no more perfect than the rest of us. We expect people to feel shame. And mostly, they do. So, shame silence is all the things we say and feel and do that keep us feeling ashamed about our bodies. It can include covering up our bodies so no one can see their form. It can include wearing natural makeup, which is makeup that's supposed to look like you're not wearing any. Or it can be really overt, explicit makeup, like contouring, which changes the shape of your face quite drastically. It can be exercising, lifting weights, or dieting to try to reach a body ideal that can never actually be reached because the journey of improvement is never over. And we can also feel shame about feeling shame. So one woman I spoke to after a talk said to me that she'd put on a bit of weight during lockdown, as many of us did, and she felt ashamed of that weight. But she also identified as a feminist, and that meant that she felt shame about feeling ashamed. She thought that she ought to be able to resist and reject those norms that women should care about their weight. But these norms are so ubiquitous, so powerful, that it's incredibly difficult to resist. And so for that woman, shame about her weight was layered on top with shame about shame. That's what shame tenants is. But what's wrong with it? Well, to some extent, I hope the answer is obvious. Psychologists diagnose what they call the epidemic of appearance anxiety because appearance anxiety and body shame is associated with various kinds of mental distress, with depression, low self-esteem. And it can also be a factor in various forms of harmful behaviours such as disordered eating and self-harm. Beyond psychology, we might observe that some of the things we do to try to make our bodies different are painful, or risky or dangerous, or simply they just cost a lot in time and in money. But shame tenants, I suggest, is also a political problem. It's a political problem because it connects to patterns of inequality and hierarchy. To some extent, we all feel appearance anxiety, or the vast majority of us do, but appearance anxiety operates differently depending on our sex and gender, our race, our age, and our disability status. Some groups are particularly vulnerable to appearance anxiety, and high amongst this group are women, girls, and gender diverse people, and particularly during puberty. Now, shame is a special sort of emotion, because it's an emotion about our status. 
If we compare shame with its close relative, embarrassment, we can see the difference. Embarrassment is a feeling, an unpleasant feeling that you get when you've done something wrong or inappropriate at a particular time. As the moment fades and the memory of the moment fades, then the embarrassment can fade away as well. But shame isn't like that. Shame isn't a bad feeling about something you've done. Shame is a feeling about who we are. Shame is the feeling that we are not equal to others, that our status is diminished or degraded. And so shame is something that can be weaponized against us. When we are encouraged to feel shame about ourselves, and that encouragement is part of a project to sell things to us, that's a real injustice. Okay, so I've told you what shame tenants is, and I've told you what's wrong with it. What can we do about it? Well, in general, the, the antidote to shame is pride. Think of gay pride. That was a concerted, collected effort made to rebut the shame imposed by homophobic laws and norms. So you might think the antidote to shame tenants about bodies is pride about our bodies. Maybe we should try to feel proud of our bodies. And that's the approach advocated by body positivity activists. Now, there's nothing wrong with body positivity. It's certainly much better than body negativity. But body positivity can't be the only solution to shame tenants. For a start, it's incredibly difficult to do. The pressure's on us to feel that our bodies could be better and to feel shame. Shame is so expected that very few of us can manage to achieve pure self-love at all times. And then, of course, body positivity can become just another way to fail, like the woman I told you about earlier described. You can feel shame about your body and you can feel shame about feeling ashamed as well. So body positivity is limited then because it suggests that the way to solve an overwhelming social and political problem is individual. And we can't be expected to solve this on our own. This is something we have to do together. So what can we do? Well, to some extent, governments can help with this problem. Governments can involve themselves in regulating the companies that try to sell us shame. Governments can regulate what companies can advertise, how they can advertise, the claims they can make, and even the products that they provide. So one recent example of this is new legislation that has made using cosmetic Botox and fillers illegal for children under 18. That's just very recently come in last year, that legislation. But the cosmetic procedures industry is still woefully underregulated. Um, now, I have no medical qualifications whatsoever, but if you are over 18, it would be legal for me to inject facial fillers into you for money on this stage right here. So there's still a lot of room for regulation, but we can also go beyond regulation. We need to be aware of the dangers of social media. We need to be aware that all the images we see have been filtered or moderated, that most of the videos we watch are adverts either explicitly adverts for themselves or they're used to make money somewhere. We need to be skeptical of the claims we see on social media. We might also think of changing the way we talk to each other or even to ourselves about our bodies. It's generally a bad idea to comment on somebody's appearance, at least when their body is concerned, because there are lots and lots of examples of people suffering long lasting, quite deep shame from comments about their bodies. And sometimes these comments can be very small. One example I talk about in Intact is the case of a girl who had extensive cosmetic surgery on her face as a teenager because she had been teased as a younger child for having big ears, and that shame never left her. But the comments don't even have to be criticisms. One example in Hadley Freeman's recent book, Good Girls, is this, she says one trigger for her devastating anorexia was a comment she received from a school friend. And the school friend said to her that she wished that she wasn't as skinny as she was, and she wished that she had a normal body like Hadley's. And that apparently innocuous comment was enough to trigger these deep feelings of shame. 
And sometimes even compliments can have this effect because even a compliment reinforces the fact that you're being observed, scrutinized, and judged. So generally, perhaps we should try not to talk about each other's bodies. But the most important thing we can do to combat shamefulness is to understand it. We need to recognize where we are. It's incredibly um, common. It's normal in the sense of common for you to feel shame about your body in some respects. It would be astonishing if you didn't, if you had managed to escape. But feeling shame about your body in some moments or in some ways doesn't mean that your body itself is wrong. We feel shame about our bodies because we're encouraged to do so. When all of us feel that shame, then our bodies can't be the reason. We are being sold shame so that others can make money from it. Let's try to refuse to buy. Thank you. Thank you.